let us uh, look at um, the Hall effect, the quantum Hall effect that we have been talking about uh, in a symmetric gauge. Uh, what I mean by a symmetric gauge is uh, uh, that uh, we have been talking about the Landau gauge which is either in the x direction uh, that is the, the vector potential to be either in the x direction or in the y direction. We have uh, actually dealt with both of them, but um, uh, these particular thing where uh, this symmetric gauge where the system has uh, you know circular symmetry uh, will be useful. And not only that, uh, we shall need it later for uh, discussing the fractional quantum Hall effect. Okay. So, uh, we start discussing about symmetric gauge. So, what I mean by symmetric gauge is that uh, for a constant magnetic field, the vector potential is given by half r cross b and uh, this will have to be inserted into the Schrodinger equation and hence solve. Okay. Now, of course, this has um, both the x and the y component which is written as uh, it is a y x cap minus uh, x y cap and uh, it is a valid vector potential because if you take the curl of it, it gives you the magnetic field in the z direction. So, uh, this uh, has rotational uh, symmetry. All right. So, uh, now our Hamiltonian is the same basically the which is a P uh, plus E A uh, square over 2 m. It is just P square over 2 m uh, in absence of the magnetic field, but uh, the uh, mechanical momentum uh, gets a change or gets transformed into P plus E A in presence of the magnetic field. All right, so this uh, can be now written as so. Let me introduce a new momentum which is equal to a pi. So let's write it as pi square over two m, where pi is of course uh, the canonical momentum now, which is equal to p plus e a that takes into account the effect of this vector potential. So pi is the new momentum, and um, it obeys uh, the commutation relations. So, let us write commutation relations of, uh, of the pi. So, one can check easily that uh, pi x and pi y is, uh, is has a relation which is i h uh, cross square divided by L b square. Uh, this is of course uh, different than p x and p y. In absence of a magnetic field p x and p y would commute, but um, in presence of a magnetic field they would not commute and particularly in this uh, particular situation they would definitely not um, commute. Okay. So, we can write down the Hamiltonian here which will do that. So, let me write down the Hamiltonian. So, the Hamiltonian is 1 uh, by 2 m and uh, I have a uh, uh, p x plus e b y by 2 and a square and plus uh, p y minus e b x by 2 square. Okay. So, the pi x and pi y are these And you can check that these obey a commutation relation, which it is i h cross square divided by L b square, where uh, L b is nothing but the magnetic length that we have seen uh, several times earlier. Okay, so this is equal to h cross over E b. This uh, basically this pi gives uh, a new set of uh, canonical operators, which obey certain commutation relations, which are uh, shown here. Okay, now the algebra of harmonic oscillators. We know at the back of our mind that this uh, solutions are going to be 
harmonic oscillator solutions uh, because if you change the form of the vector potential, uh, the problem does not change and neither the outcomes of the problem that is the Eigen solutions uh, would not change uh, if you change the gauge. Uh, so, we know that these are going to be still harmonic oscillator and uh, I am sure that you are um, familiar with the harmonic oscillator in terms of the operator algebra using A and A dagger uh, where A actually annihilates uh, a boson uh, or an oscillator from a state N. So, it, it reduces to uh, in the Fox space, the Fox space means the number of uh, particles basis, it reduces the number of particles and A dagger increases the number of particles. So, it, it goes to the uh, from one level to the next level by applying an A dagger. Uh, and by applying an A uh, which is an annihilation operator, uh, one can uh, go from a lower energy level which is uh, N minus 1. So, from N by applying, uh, so there is a A dagger which acts on uh, N and it gives you uh, something uh, and it gives you a N plus 1 and uh, it, this A acting on N, it gives you a something and n minus 1 and this something is called as uh, root over of n and this something is root over of n plus 1. Uh, you can check that. Okay. So, uh, so, these a and a dagger operators form the basis of these problems and uh, uh, just uh, following that uh, if you uh, now, uh, these A and A daggers are of course, combinations of X and P. Okay? So, it is uh, written in terms of linear combinations of X and P. So, um, it is in terms of, so A is written as some X plus I P and A dagger is written some X minus I P or the reverse of it uh, along with some factors which uh, properly give you the, uh, the commutation relations of X and P. Okay, in terms of A and A dagger. So, A and A dagger have their own commutation relations because these are uh, these oscillators are bosons. So, they obey bosonic commutation relations and X and P commutation relations are known which uh, is given by X P is equal to I H cross. Okay. And uh, this operator algebra is quite familiar uh, to the first course of quantum mechanics. So, uh, I leave it to you to brush up that. And if you now uh, in terms of these uh, pi uh, operators that is pi x and pi y uh, in presence of these uh, uh, magnetic field which is represented by a, a symmetric gauge, then um, if one defines that A dagger equal to 1 by root 2 uh, h and um, uh, pi uh, x plus i pi y. Uh, and A to be equal to 1 by root 2 H and uh, pi X minus I pi Y. Okay. Uh, so, this you can check that A and A dagger have a commutation relation which is equal to 1 uh, and for that you require the commutation relations of pi X and pi Y which is what we have derived. Okay. So, in terms of this operator uh, Hamiltonian which we have written earlier, this Hamiltonian, uh, this Hamiltonian that you see here uh, in this uh, step. So, let us call this as again as equation 1, this as equation 2, this as equation 3 and uh, this as equation 4. So, if you uh, uh, look at equation 3 or rather put them in equation 3, uh, you get H to be equal to uh, H cross omega B, uh, the cyclotron frequency A dagger A plus half and uh, A dagger A is nothing but the uh, number operator. It just counts the number of oscillators in a given state uh, in the Fox space with uh, you know index N. So, A dagger A, it yields the number operator for the problem. So, if this is the number operator, so, this is an operator and this A dagger A acting on N will give me a N and a N. So, this uh, you can write it as it is an eigenvalue. So, this is that uh, the wave function or the Fox space 
uh, basis and uh, so this gives you the Eigen value and hence you have h cross omega b equal to n plus half uh, same thing that you have seen earlier uh, and omega b is nothing but equal to E b over m. Okay. Even though uh, and some new operators have been introduced and uh, new commutation relations you have seen, but there is something very important uh, which is going to come up in this context which you should uh, keep in mind because when we discuss the fractional quantum Hall effect that is going to be very important. Okay. So, um, for convenience let me write that I will use that in just a while that let me use some operator which is x x cap plus y y cap uh, and uh, this is equal to nothing but r minus l b square divided by h cross and uh, z uh, cross pi this pi operator ok. So, uh, so I introduce some vector operator uh, in terms of these uh, pi operators and um, they of course uh, keep the commutation relations that uh, we are interested in. Uh, so, these uh, components of this operator uh, it uh, replace I mean it gives you the proper commutation relations for pi. So, that is what we wanted to write down. So, h is of course replaced by uh, the L b square in the commutation relation that uh, you are uh, mostly aware of between the position variable and the momentum variable. Now, this we really have a two dimensional symmetry, we have a circular symmetry of the problem because if you look at the gauge that we have chosen, it has a y x cap and a x y cap. The only problem that we see uh, with this energy, this energy expression which you are very familiar with in the context of both harmonic oscillator and electron in a magnetic field is that uh, we find only one quantum number which is n, but uh, there should be another quantum number for this particular problem and that is a very important quantity or that is uh, you know a conserved quantity in this uh, particular case and um, that comes from the degeneracy. Let us see how that arises in this uh, present context. So, uh, we talk about degeneracy ok. So, what is this degeneracy? We have uh, talked about this in details. Uh, this is equal to uh, the degeneracy if you go back and look at earlier discussions you will see that this is equal to L x into L y uh, into E b divided by h ok where L x and L y are dimensions of the sample. So, this is like the uh, maximum degeneracy which is arising out of uh, the number of uh, you know states or particular Landau level contains a very large number of states and this counts the number of states that each of the Landau levels comprises of ok. So, uh, you remember this phi 0 which is called as a flux quantum is nothing but h over e. So, I can move this e down and write it as L x L y into b divided by h over e. And now, this uh, L x into L y is nothing but a. Uh, so, this is b into a divided by some phi 0 that is the flux quantum and this uh, really is uh, the degeneracy that we talk about uh, in uh, usual uh, sense. Uh, so, this is nothing but phi over phi 0 ok. This uh, phi over phi 0 which means that uh, the flux that threads the sample divided by the quantum of flux. So, that is that gives you the degeneracy of this. Now, um, because uh, of there is a very large number of electrons uh, that must be occupying each of those degenerate states uh, and uh, uh, such large number of electrons actually makes uh, the problem uh, more difficult because suppose you want to take into account the interaction between the electrons. If a particular state contains uh, or a particular Landau level contains a large number of electrons then there has to be 
electronic uh, interactions and we have no idea how to deal with it exactly uh, unless we do a computational exercise. But suppose we want to do it uh, perturbatively or want, want to deal with it perturbatively uh, that is also uh, impossible because it becomes an infinitely degenerate perturbation theory and uh, that becomes an intractable problem. Okay. So, uh, but you see that uh, if you have n to be the total number of electrons, suppose, then uh, g over n okay, is nothing but uh, equal to the, again that E b over you know uh, sort of n h uh, and, and so on. And uh, so, this becomes so g over n I have taken out the area. So, this becomes g over a and then I divide it by the number of uh, total number of particles. Okay. So, this becomes equal to uh, n h um, and um, so, uh, your uh, n is uh, nothing but that is equal to. Okay. So, this uh, does not have to be uh, in the sense that it can be still g uh, and this uh, uh, n is equal to uh, n over a okay? uh, so that everything falls in place. So, this is uh, degeneracy divided by the number of particles. Now, if you look at uh, the conductivity expressions which we get for the Hall effect. So, the Hall conductivity is nothing but n e over b. This is we have derived this a number of times and uh, also the um, the quantization says that it is a e square over h into nu, where nu is equal to 1, 2, 3, etcetera, etcetera. Okay? So, if I equate because both of them are same, so it is n e over b is equal to e square over h into nu and uh, so this becomes equal to, uh, so 1 e cancels and uh, I can write this as uh, uh, n over n h over uh, nu uh, equal to E b uh, and uh, so on. So, basically uh, you get exactly the same relation that you have gotten here. So, uh, your E b over n h um, E b over n h is equal to 1 over nu and uh, this is uh, the nothing but the restatement of this equation that we have uh, written down earlier. Okay? Uh, we have not been numbering the equations, but let us say this is equation 5, uh, this is equation 6, this is equation 7 and let us say this is uh, equation 8 and this is equation 9. So, equation 8 and 9 are um, identical and uh, this is uh, really also uh, useful for interpreting this um, fractional quantum Hall effect to be precise because uh, uh, for a filling fraction uh, nu equal to one third, it means that um, uh, there are three available states for uh, per particle uh, for the uh, Landau level. For the lowest Landau level, we are only interested in the lowest Landau level or most of the time we are interested in the lowest Landau level unless uh, there are some pathological signatures that. Uh, uh, makes us go to or rather deal with uh, or consider uh, higher Landau levels. So, uh, this is what the interpretation of nu is for a fractional quantum Hall effect and on the other hand, the integer quantum Hall effect for that case nu gives uh, uh, the total number of uh, filled Landau levels. Okay? So, uh, these are the things that we need need to know or rather we already know about this. Okay? It is just that the uh, context of the fractional quantum Hall effect is being uh, talked about. So, this is one of the most uh, prominent fractions that uh, one uh, mentions uh, in the context of this uh, fractional quantum Hall effect. Okay? So, uh, let me write down the Hamiltonian which uh, we have written down just a while back. So, this is uh, P x plus E b uh, y by 2 uh, square plus uh, P y minus E b x by 2 square that is the Hamiltonian here 
and I can write that down as introducing that uh, R operator and the pi x and the pi uh, y operator I can uh, I can write this. But then you know I want to uh, introduce a new operator here and that operator is called as the LZ and the LZ if you define LZ to be like minus h cross divided by 2 LB square uh, x square plus y square uh, plus LB square divided by 2 h cross uh, pi x square plus uh, pi y square. Okay. To remind you what is LZ? LZ is nothing but the Z component of the angular momentum. And uh, this will now deal with the degeneracy or rather the eigenvalues of LZ will deal with the degeneracy. Just to give you a short reminder uh, of uh, the first course of quantum mechanics on the uh, algebra of angular momentum. See uh, these Lx, uh, Ly, this commutation relations is like Ih cross Lz. So in fact, uh, these angular momentum operators are neither uh, fermions nor bosons, they have their own commutation relations and so on. So uh, L, um, Y, L, Z, so this is uh, really uh, in a cyclic fashion, it is equal to I, H cross L, X and uh, L, Z, uh, L, X is equal to I, H cross L, Y. Um, in fact, uh, you can write this, combine this as L, I, L, J equal to i epsilon i j k um, l k, uh, there is h cross of course, l k and uh, let me not forget the h cross, uh, h cross sets the scale of the problem. So, what I am trying to say is that, uh, so I epsilon i j k is called as a Levi-Civita tensor which is um, equal to 1 when i j k are, uh, uh, are clockwise. Um, are cyclic basically which means that uh, if you write down uh, i j k uh, in the clockwise fashion then epsilon i j k equal to 1. Uh, however, uh, if you break the clockwise thing that is if you say j i k then uh, that uh, picks up a negative sign. Okay? So, the if you write uh, l y l x then it will be a negative i h cross l k. Okay. So, this takes care of that uh, and um, if two of the indices are same, uh, then of course, this is equal to 0, the Levi-Civita tensor is equal to 0 and uh, then we can understand uh, that if i and j are to be same, then of course, they commute and then and the commutation relation gives you 0. Okay. And th there is also another way to uh, combine this commutation relation, it is called i h cross uh, l cross l is i h cross l this should you know make you rethink that L is not a classical operator because uh, any classical vector would have given you when you cross it with itself it gives you 0, but uh, these are uh, quantum mechanical operators uh, and uh, which uh, when you cross it with itself it gives you I H cross L and is basically the same thing and then there are many relations like L square commutes with all components of L i and uh, we actually pick up uh, to solve the you know the second order differential equation uh, that arises out of these angular momentum vector or rather the square of the angular momentum. We use uh, L square and L z uh, to be the basis for our problem uh, because L z is actually having a very simple form uh, L z depends only on like del del phi where phi is the the variable the um, azimuthal uh, angle I mean theta and phi you know uh, theta is the angle and this phi is the other angle that you have uh, I mean uh, in this particular sense. So, there is a vector r, so this vector r so the magnitude is r and this angle is theta and this is phi, so we are talking about that phi. Okay. So, the angular momentum uh, is being invoked into, remember when we have uh, taken a gauge, the Landau gauge, uh, which was either P x or P y were found to be conserved and uh, that is what gave rise to the degeneracy because uh, 
uh, I say Px is conserved, then any value of Kx would uh, satisfy the n plus of h cross omega for the spectrum. And similarly, if uh, you know Py is conserved, then any value of Ky would have uh, given the same spectrum. So, n becomes independent of either Kx or Ky and the quantization that comes along with. So, nx and ny and that is what give rise to this uh, degeneracy. Here, uh, none of them are conserved, Px and Py are not conserved because you see that in this equation, equation number 10 that you have uh, both Px, Py and x and y. So, if all these variables are there or these operators are there together, then of course, nothing uh, Px, Py are not conserved uh, because they do not commute with uh, each one, the Px will not commute with x and uh, Py will not commute with y. Instead, the Lz commutes with the Hamiltonian, uh, this you can check that Hlz is equal to 0. So, Hlz equal to 0 and let me uh, remind you that what is Lz, what is the eigenvalue of Lz or and L square? Uh, this is a function called as the spherical harmonics which gives you, so Lz acting on this will give us uh, m h cross y l m uh, theta phi. Okay. So, Lz is a good quantum number and not Px and uh, Py and so on. So, Lz uh, if you put in the relationship that we have talked about, let us call this as equation 11 and uh, look at uh, the definition of A and A dagger that we have written down in equation 5. So, if you put uh, equation 5 that is A and A dagger, you get a, a neat relation for the Lz operator which is equal to H cross uh, A dagger A minus B dagger B where okay. Uh, so, um, we introduce new operators uh, B and B dagger uh, such that uh, the eigenstates of these uh, H written in equation 10 uh, can be written as uh, uh, now we will write that psi in terms of the quantum numbers. So, let us uh, write them as n m, n we have already seen n comes in the uh, energy expression where n takes values 0, 1, 2, 3, etcetera. So, this is written as a ket n m uh, which is equal to a dagger to the power n uh, b dagger to the power m and divided by uh, root over of uh, n factorial and m factorial and this acts on 0, 0. So, that is uh, n equal to 0, m equal to 0 are the states which let us call them as vacuum. So, uh, we have um, introduced these uh, uh, new a and b operators in order to write um, the eigenstates of 10 that is equation 10, the Hamiltonian in equation 10. So, these actually are the eigenstates of uh, equation 10, let us call them as 13 and so on. Okay. So, the quantum number n uh, denotes energy and m denotes degeneracy. Okay. And um, uh, you know it is uh, convenient in this particular context uh, to use uh, the complex number z which is given by x plus i y and uh, uh, we will of course, discuss this in little more details definitely uh, with more details than what we are doing now. For the lowest Landau level, Uh, we will call this as LLL. Okay. There is a standard uh, terminology that is used here. So, psi LLL of z this is equal to this is the so it is z to the power m and uh, exponential minus z square divided by 4 lb square and so on. Okay. So, I am only uh, writing the you know the unnormalized part of the wave function. So, there is a Gaussian which you know that it is there in the harmonic oscillator problem and then uh, there is a, a Jastrow factor 
uh, which uh, does not let two electrons um, come very close to each other uh, because of uh, the strong Coulomb repulsion that you have. Uh, but uh, we will uh, talk about uh, this in more details uh, later. So, m of course is equal to m 0 1 2 etcetera so on. See this m uh, that uh, you know depicts or rather it represents the angular momentum uh, quantum number. In general in quantum mechanics problem uh, these uh, m takes values minus l to plus l uh, when you have a ylm function and so on. Uh, but here of course there is no l it is only n and m and we have formulated the problem in terms of uh, so energy is a conserved quantity which gives you uh, one quantum number which is n and lz is a uh, conserved quantity which gives another uh, another quantum number m and uh, we have uh, written the lowest Landau level which is the most uh, sort of important thing in our uh, discussion that the lowest Landau level will be uh, discussed mostly in the context of quantum Hall effect and uh, this is how the lowest Landau level is written down. So, we have solved the problem in the uh, mixed gauge or the symmetric gauge uh, where A is given by half R cross B and neither P x nor P y are conserved in that case. And we, but fortunately we have been able to find that there is uh, <coughs> another quantity that is conserved uh, that apart from the energy uh, which is that L z ok. And um, this is this part is called as a Gaussian which we have seen that is, is present there. And then this is that a Hermite polynomial, but this Hermite polynomial is now written um, in terms of the complex number. All right, let me um, sort of go to another uh, topic and uh, which uh, is quite important and so on. Uh, let me write down the title of the topic and mostly I will be discussing. So, please uh, I mean listen to me uh, carefully. Uh, so, the topic is 2 D electron gas this you know uh, to tight binding model. systems and um, uh, so I will say the role of the periodic potential. We have been talking about 2 D electron gases and that part is clear that why we have been talking about 2 D electron gases because the experiments demand that we deal with 2 D electron gases which have a lot of defects and disorder and uh, which we have seen that they are actually beneficial to the um, study of quantum Hall effect because that uh, broadens the Landau levels and uh, the chemical potential uh, gets to spend some time in that uh, band so that it gives you a plateau. Otherwise, without that there would be no plateau and then it will be a straight line uh, monotonically increasing with B ok. <clears throat> so, uh, this 2 D electron gas is being uh, exposed to a transverse magnetic field ok. And uh, that makes the problem somewhat uh, complicated and strange because uh, why I am saying strange is that the system does not have a time reversal invariance. The time reversal invariance is broken by the uh, uh, magnetic field present in the system. And um, if you want to understand why magnetic field uh, breaks time reversal invariance, uh, one simple way to uh, see it is that the curl of B equal to uh, mu 0 j. So, uh, when I say time reversal invariance, I do not uh, really mean reversing time or t goes to minus t. What I mean is that a particle is moving with a velocity v plus v ok. Now, if the, uh, the particle changes the direction of its motion that is if it starts moving with a minus v, does the physics remain unaltered? That is the meaning of time reversal invariance and in presence of a magnetic field that does not happen. You can understand it uh, by you have a j which is a current density and the current density actually involves a negative sign to be picked up 
uh, as because a current is nothing but the charge by time and if you are changing the sign of t uh, the current changes sign hence the current density would change sign uh, and under such time reversal invariance in that case b will have to change sign which means it does not remain invariant. And another simple way of understanding it is that you know uh, there is a, a phase uh, that uh, the wave function picks up in presence of the magnetic field and uh, this phase is equal to um, I integral A dot dl uh, which you can write it as B dot ds uh, which is nothing but the flux. So, this is the you know the phase that the electron or the charged particle picks up uh, the wave function of the charged particle picks up. So, when you evolve it with time usually a wave function is evolved like psi uh, exponential i omega t where omega denotes the energy of the of the system or h cross omega. So, uh, both psi exponential i omega t and minus i omega t they denote uh, valid solutions of the problem. So, if t is changed to minus t that is also a valid solution, but here what happens is that uh, you already have a phase. So, the wave function is exponential i phi and then now you uh, put a, a dynamical factor that is uh, you evolve it with time and uh, now you change the, the time to minus t then uh, it, it becomes just like this exponential minus t. So, this is not the same as uh, the wave function that is um, would have been there without the magnetic field. So, magnetic field uh, breaks time reversal invariance and uh, the disorder which is uh, present in the system it breaks the translational invariance ok. So, the system is left with almost no symmetries. So, we know that uh, this you might have learnt in classical mechanics uh, etcetera which goes by the name Noether's theorem that if there is a, a conserved quantity the corresponding or rather if, if the system remains invariant under certain operation then there is a physical quantity that remains conserved and another way of stating this is that if there is a symmetry then the corresponding quantum number becomes conserved. So, if you talk about a hydrogen atom it it is a spherical thing. So, I will just draw it and then I will remove it later. Uh, there is a proton here, there is an electron here, this is just say in a spherical shell it is going around the nucleus. This has a rotational symmetry right, I mean if you rotate the atom by a certain angle uh, the system does not change. So, uh, and because there is a rotational symmetry the angular momentum remains conserved and uh, the corresponding quantum numbers of the angular momentum which are L and M in this case that we talk about that they remain conserved as well ok. Uh, and you can represent the wave function in terms of those conserved quantum numbers which become gives you the eigenstates of the problem. And similarly uh, you know if you have a, a translational invariance then you can write down the wave function as in terms of the momentum variable that is a k ok. So, you can write down so exponential i k x is a solution is a plane wave solution where k is a good quantum number. So, that there is the system is translationally invariant and you can use the momentum or the wave vector to be a conserved quantity. So, if k is conserved as n pi over L uh, then n becomes so k n then n becomes a good quantum number for this problem. Uh, unfortunately, our system has lost both of them. Uh, and uh, the disorder is as I said it is intrinsic to the 2D electron gas. So, they have to be there ok. Still the quantization of the plateaus are preserved. So, this is the main thing which is uh, surprising 
but uh, nevertheless it is true, it is experimentally true and if it is true there must be a strong reason for that or there must be something that is protecting these uh, plateaus. And it turns out that uh, it, there is really uh, something that protects uh, or rather in systems with broken time reversal invariance, uh, it shows a uh, quantized Hall effect or quantum Hall effect where the plateaus are related to a topological invariant which has a name churn number. So, the previous discussion that we have on Kubo formula, so if you derive Kubo formula for the particular case of quantum Hall effect, then that will give you this uh, conductivity will be quantized in terms of n e square over h, where n denotes um, the numbers 1, 2, 3, etc. And uh, these churn number also it turns out that for a time reversal invariance broken system, the conductivity is like c into e square over h where c is called as a churn number and this churn number um, takes only integer values okay? and it takes values such as um, maybe 0, 1, 2 and so on so forth. Okay? And uh, the reason that even if a 2D electron gas in presence of a magnetic field, uh, it is low on symmetries. Uh, however, the plateaus exist because the plateaus are related to certain topological invariant and these invariants only can change discreetly from one value to another, but it cannot uh, just like that, uh, that is it cannot be slowly uh, made to vanish. So, it, it just abruptly take from uh, 1 to 2 to 3 and so on, which is what we have seen in the plateaus. Now, in order to see this churn number or the topological invariant or uh, they are in general called as the uh, TKNN invariants uh, uh, by the name Thaulis, Komoto, Nightingale and uh, Nice. Uh, so, it is called TKNN uh, invariant. Uh, uh, so T is Thaulis uh, Komoto uh, Nightingale and his name is the last one is uh, uh, it is nice uh, Den Nice uh, N I J S uh, um, that is the sort of generic name for the topological invariant and um, maybe some other invariants are uh, come into this and um, we will see that uh, one more uh, such invariant which is called as a Z2 invariant. Okay. So, usually in condensed matter physics, uh, the physical properties are protected by symmetries which is what we have discussed and uh, so, it is uh, now becomes an important thing to understand for us that uh, how the protection of the Hall plateaus in presence of periodic potential where the translational invariance is preserved uh, and uh, one can have block bands in it. What I am trying to say is that it is very uh, difficult to understand to protection in the context of these um, topological invariant. Though we will also derive uh, from the Kubo formula this uh, churn number and hence the quantization of the Hall plateaus, uh, quantization in the resistivity or the quanti um, conductivity of the Hall plateaus. But it is much easier to understand this quantization if you take a translationally invariant system or a system in a periodic potential. So, what I mean by system in a periodic potential, so if you uh, recall the band theory of solids that you have learned in the first course of solid state physics where you have uh, the there are these ions or uh, the atoms which are sitting I mean let us talk about just ions and uh, these ions are uh, like gives potentials like this. Uh, I am just uh, assuming them to be attractive they could be repulsive as well. Uh, so, I am and so on and an electron that passes through it 
okay, it is a negatively charged particle that passes through it. So, electrons are not interacting among themselves, okay, at least we ignore that, but what we take into account is that this electron while it passes through this periodic potential which has this property that V of R equal to V of R plus R where this R is this periodicity in real space. In that case, the wave function of the particle is given by Bloch's theorem which states that a psi uh, a k of R is equal to u k of R and exponential i k dot R. Okay. This is called as a Bloch's theorem and it tells you that this fellow this u k of r picks up the periodicity of the lattice which means u k of r is equal to u k of r plus r and this is called as a Bloch's theorem. See slowly we have migrated from the 2 d electron gas to a periodic potential which has translational symmetry because we need to understand how this problem of quantization of Hall plateaus be understood through a calculation. As I said I will also show that from the Kubo formula how the conductivity of the 2 d electron gas is really related to uh, the, the churn number okay, which is a topological invariant. So, if you look at this uh, expression that I have written down here, this is the exactly the same expression I have written down. Uh, so, this one is the same expression that I have written down here, uh, here okay, where I just I have used two symbols for this proportionality which are nu and c and um, uh, what I say is that the churn number is um, replaces nu and since churn number is an invariant is a topological invariant nu also is an invariant and that is why the plateaus exist. But it is difficult to show these things by doing calculations um, in a system such as a 2D electron gas. Okay? So, what we uh, decide to do is we will uh, show this in a system which has uh, translational invariance that is uh, the case of a periodic potential. Okay. And uh, for a periodic potential these uh, Bloch's theorem tells you uh, exactly what the wave functions are. Now, you know wave functions you know only half of the story because you also need to know uh, the energy eigenfunctions or rather energy eigenvalues so to say. Eigenfunctions are this. Um, the eigenvalues are obtained uh, only within an approximation and one of the approximations that you might have seen um, in your uh, solid state physics course is the one that is called as the tight binding approximation. Okay? So, that is uh, like saying that the electronic wave function is tightly bound uh, to each of the uh, lattice sites and it has only very minor overlap with the neighboring ion and very uh, minor overlap such that you just allow the electron to go from one, one site to another, one uh, site in the crystal lattice to another. Uh, I have just shown it in one dimension, but you can generalize it to three dimension. In fact, I am writing this with a k vector which means that I really do mean um, that we are talking about a three dimension. Uh, we will have to now include the magnetic field. Now, there is something interesting about it. When we uh, the magnetic field of course, uh, breaks the time reversal uh, invariance and uh, um, we have these block spectrum further get split into um, some complex uh, fractal energy spectrum. And uh, now, what, what does it mean by fractal? Uh, fractals are self similar objects. Okay? Um, if you want to know more on fractals, there are uh, many uh, documents that are on fractal, it, it is characterized by a fractional dimension. Okay? Uh, so, this fractal like spectrum is known as the Hofstadter butterfly. So, you have periodicity of the wave function that becomes block bands, put magnetic field into that, the farther the block bands become uh, you know it, it sort of 
uh, splits into complex fractal energy spectrum which is known as the Hofstadter butterfly. I will just write this name so that um, Hofstadter butterfly. The spectrum is called Hofstadter butterfly. Spectrum means the energy eigenvalues. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, this uh, presence of a magnetic field is important to be taken into account in the context of a crystal lattice. Okay? So, this is the important thing and it will help us to understand that how the Hall plateaus are related to the topological invariant namely say for example, a churn number. Okay? Uh, but there is one uh, subtle point at this uh, juncture which deserves a mention that um, the magnetic flux that threads uh, a crystal lattice, suppose we are talking about a crystal lattice like this, okay? just a square lattice. So, this is one placket of a square lattice. So, uh, you need to thread it by a magnetic field. Now, these are uh, the lattice constants which are of the order of angstrom, okay? maybe 2 to 3 angstrom. Okay? But however, you want this threading or the flux that goes through this uh, squarish region uh, should be in unit of these uh, phi 0 which is equal to uh, phi 0 is equal to h over e. Okay? So, you want these uh, flux that penetrates which is magnetic field multiplied by the area of the square that I have drawn here. Okay? So, the strength of the magnetic fields it has to be extremely large for uh, you know uh, you, this phi over phi 0 to have to be a number okay? or a fraction say for example. So, that is why uh, people have uh, to avoid this that you cannot have too large magnetic field that becomes um, absolutely impractical in terms of experiments because you need large very large electromagnets and so on and so forth. So, uh, people have artificially engineered um, super lattices with very large lattice constants. Say uh, graphene is put on uh, you know on a substrate of a hexagonal boron nitride and this makes a super lattice and this super lattice has a large uh, um, lattice constant and then if you have large lattice constants at least 10 times bigger or, uh, or even more then you can have this um, the flux to be also proportionately larger. Okay? Now, it is important to understand that as an electron is hops on the uh, lattice uh, in a in a 2d electron gas we have seen that p goes to p plus ea where e is the electronic charge and a is the the vector potential in a lattice what happens is that the t it becomes like t equal to exponential i phi that is when an electron hops uh, from one side to another, the hopping term or the, the ability to jump, it is say t here, it is a t exponential i phi and uh, just to remind you that I have been talking about that I gave you the, the wave function, uh, but I have not told anything about the energy and the energy can be obtained within some approximation which is called as a tight binding approximation. And uh, this in the tight binding approximation you can write down the energy eigenvalues where k is a good quantum number to be cos uh, k x a plus k y a in two dimension. Uh, or uh, in three dimension you have a cos k z a and so on. Okay? Uh, this is a simple cubic lattice, the tight binding dispersion for a simple cubic lattice and also a monoatomic lattice. Okay? Uh, we will be talking about a more complicated scenario than that and um, but we can just uh, two dimension you can just uh, cut down on the last term that is cos k z a and you have a tight binding dispersion in 2 d. So, this is that t uh, is the strength of hopping that we have written here and that undergoes modulation in phase by t exponential i phi. So, this is called as a piles coupling. So, p e i e r l s piles coupling.
okay. So, this uh, picking up of phase is called as piles coupling and this you see that uh, the system actually loses uh, translational invariance. So, whether you can now use k as a vector, but fortunately enough there is uh, even if the, uh, the system does not have translational invariance over say 2, 3 or 4 sites and so on because it becomes t e to the power 2 i phi then it becomes t e to the power 3 i phi and so on okay and it sort of goes but you can always uh, these phi which is uh, nothing but this a dot dl okay and this you can adjust such that because your you know exponential i uh, phi is same as exponential i phi plus 2 pi. So, if this phase gets modulated by a full 2 pi then you get back the same hopping. So, instead of sort of translational invariance everywhere you do not get that but what you get is that I am just talking about in one dimension you get a translational invariance on a number of uh, sites. So, that is called as a magnetic translational invariance or a magnetic translation a Brillouin zone uh, if you wish to call it. And then uh, so, the phase will get modulated and will complete a phase of 2 pi. So, this phase is actually you know it is like uh, there is a E by H also and that tells you that this phase is nothing but exponential i uh, phi by phi 0 okay because I think there is a, a h here okay. So, a dot dl if you use uh, a over a closed thing uh, if you use uh, Stokes theorem then it uh, is uh, b dot ds which is uh, so uh, by Stokes theorem a dot dl uh, over some closed contour is equal to some b dot ds where ds is actually the, the surface area which encloses the contour and then this uh, phi by phi 0. So, if you have this phi which is equal to 2 uh, pi n into phi 0 for some value of uh, phi if it matches with that then you have this translational invariance and then uh, you can take that as the periodic lattice and then do the calculations. Uh, we will uh, show that for a specific case because this will enable us to get for a tight binding Hamiltonian or for a periodic potential it will aid us to get the bands and we will see that how this uh, churn number okay the topological invariant which is related to the uh, the coefficient of the sigma that is the conductivity uh, how uh, that uh, comes about and how that is a constant it will uh, help us to understand all of that and we will do that uh, through a certain formalism which involves uh, Berry phase and and uh, Berry curvature, Berry connection and all that and uh, this will uh, get us close to a field called as uh, topology uh, and um, how this topology is connected to uh, these present study uh, we will be talking about that. Uh, already we have mentioned that this quantum hall state is the first realization of a topological insulator. So, there must be a topology uh, coming in and why it is a topological insulator because the bulk of the sample remains insulating and uh, it is only the edges conduct. So, it is a, a, a sort of electric field um, and a magnetic crossed magnetic field. Uh, so, there are the cyclotron orbits, but so the bulk remains non conducting or insulating, uh, but there are these electrons at the edges they do not get to complete the entire uh, full oscillation and they kind of drift uh, which gives rise to conductivity okay. So, uh, we will uh, start with um, apart from a few things uh, that are necessary we shall uh, do some calculations on uh, a crystal lattice and one of the main things that we are interested in uh, in the context is uh, called as uh, graphene okay. Graphene has been discovered in 2007 
and there was a Nobel Prize awarded to uh, Gaim and Novoselov in 2010. And the discovery actually stated that uh, uh, this is the uh, best uh, known uh, form of a 2D material. Uh, so, it is just one atom thick uh, material. And later on, graphene, uh, graphene becomes very important for a number of uh, applications uh, and um, uh, it, it has a lot of elastic property, the electrons have very large mobility, uh, it shows quantum Hall effect uh, which can you know uh, the, the room temperature you can see quantum Hall effect in graphene. Um, it has very large uh, transmission coefficient, so it is very transparent, so if light can pass through it uh, without a problem you can stretch a small bit of graphene into a large area. So, it has a very large expansion coefficient and so on. So, we will talk about all of that including of course, uh, Hall effect in graphene. Mm -hmm.